Welcome to recording of another episode of podcast Cafe Europa, Coffee Europe, well, that brings you European representation. Oh no, representation of European Commission in Czech Republic, as Institute for European Policy Europeum and Voxpot. I have to now think how to say it in English because I'm used to say it usually in Czech. Uh, it's a podcast brought to you regularly and uh, this time it's a little bit special because it's recorded live here in uh, here in Ostrava in Dolni Vitkovice because we are part of the program of Colors of Ostrava festival and uh, I'm glad that I can welcome here a part of audience also our special guest of honor uh, who is Fabio Mauri the author of DG Meme Director General for Humor on and Satire, did I say it correct? Or Memes and Memes Satire? And satire. Memes and Satire, right. So welcome here. Thank, Thank you for you. being with us. And uh, we are going to talk about the account because it's it's become quite successful. You have uh, 120,000 followers on Twitter or X, how it's now called. And it's one of the leading or the leading, probably the leading um, uh, account that brings more fun in, into Europe. And this is exactly what I want to start with, because, you know, bringing fun into European politics, that sounds a bit odd, right? Like, are you nuts? <laughs> what are you really trying to bring more fun into European politics? Is it possible? Do you get this reaction a lot? Uh, not anymore, because I think I made the point that, yes, the European politics can be fun and interesting even sometimes. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, when you live in Brussels, you, you understand that behind what is a grey appearance, there is a lot of uh, passions and ideas and fight and, you know, real uh, uh, tension. Yeah? So there is a conflict, even if in the end you find <laughs> a no negotiating uh, solution. But that doesn't mean that before the, you find an agreement, there isn't a lot of uh, uh, interesting things happening. And that's where uh, the message of DG Mim is focused. Yes, the, the you can be can be fun. Well, this what you described. This is certainly some food for journalists, for example, who, who cover these things quite thoroughly. But still, finding something fun ab about it, some, you know, a, a music angle. Does it come naturally or do you have to like really focus and search for, for funny things? Yeah, yeah. Naturally, I, it's, yeah, really, I just read the headlines and I see the fun, the, the fun angle in it. So, so yeah. of course it took exercise. I suppose it's been now more than six years. So eventually you, you develop a, a sixth sense to spot the fun in, in the EU news. A few days ago, you gave an interview to a Czech newspaper, Hospodářské noviny, and you described there that the beginning actually was quite the opposite. Not, not fun, but the opposite. You started out of despair when you were hearing some discussion on, uh, inside of European Commission where you worked at that time in, in communications department. Can you describe a bit what, what happened there? What was the thing that motivated you to start with DG Meme? Yeah, more, more than despair, anger, which is a much powerful emotion, <laughs> as Emperor Palpatine <laughs> would, would say. Uh, yes, I just, uh, well, I was in this big meeting with 400 uh, people and they were talking about the success of the EU communication and they presented the strategy on how to bring people to vote in 2019, so it's six years ago. Uh, and uh, and. Uh, and to me, it really looked like they were not good ideas. And at a certain point, I had enough of these and I raised my hand and I asked a satirical question, let's say it had a <laughs> fun angle, the question. I cannot tell you what it is because it's unfortunately, you know, uh, material that we were discussing. But eventually it, everybody started to laugh, you mm -hmm. know, in that moment. It was like in the novel uh, by Shaw, the, 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 the child pointing at the king saying the king is naked and everybody pretended he wasn't, but suddenly uh, they realized, okay, so w when everybody laughed at, at my question, I realized I, everybody knows that this is not gonna work, but they are all pretending. And I felt very angry because I think the European Union is worth fighting for and communicating for and sometimes risking to to ask questions that maybe the management might not like, but you have to you have to be a bit brave because it's worth fighting for it. And that's uh, how it started. Then I went for a beer with a friend and I was, you know, complaining about this. And, and she, she told me, yeah, OK, you are complaining so much. Well, why don't you do something? And I was like, what can I do? I'm alone. I don't have budget. 
But then it suddenly struck to me, okay, I could uh, start doing uh, memes. They are easy to produce. Memes that talk about Europe, the DG meme. And as soon as I said the name, I felt, you know, okay, this is, this is really a good project uh, that is special. And that's how it started. I think we should describe a bit what you actually do to those who do not know DG Meme yet. Uh, I hope that after this podcast there will be yeah. much more followers on your uh, on your channel. I so what do you actually do? I do something like this. I don't know where is the camera. Uh, something It's like this, there. you know. It's a simple meme that tries to capture the something that is happening in the in the European Union or something that is happening to European Union leaders. Uh, some of them are really good meme material i love your president is amazing like, looking so cool always so chilled and in control meme after meme i i somehow created a way of, of talking about europe so always i try to combine the the fun parts of the meme with a explanation or a retweet from somebody who is explaining more about the context so that what i deliver in the end i hope is also infotaining so you have the possibility of uh, laughing about things and if you don't laugh at least you can go and learn what is happening and why other people are laughing that's more or less the idea was it the first time you were trying to create content like this because your background is in it right it's not in oh, comedy yes. <laughs> oh yeah yeah very technical background um yes it's the first time i really do it in uh, such a satirical way even though before this i already tried many times to talk about um, things I like of the EU, specifically I tried to to run a forum about languages where you could talk about, you know, the little beautiful things of, uh, for example, stock phrases um, in different languages and what is polite in different cultures. That was my first attempt. And then I wrote a dystopian novel, which in a way is also a satirical depiction uh, of uh, the problems of the European Union. This was in, I started writing it in 2012 and published it in 2016. So I have been trying and failing many times. So finally, <laughs> statistically, <laughs> I, I, I managed to get a bit of audience out. So it was a bit learning by doing. Yes. Like, was it immediate success or did you have to like slowly build it up before it became popular because in Brussels bubble where I spent many years it is hugely pop popular now but w was it like this from the very beginning uh, yeah it was quite quick especially I reached the first milestone a thousand followers on Facebook back then uh, quite quickly I think probably within a month uh, because uh, Yes, yeah, suddenly it, it was everybody was was liking the, the type of content and the type of take on the communication. And it's really funny. And one of my close friends understood that it was me behind it because he saw first on my private profile. So what I did was just publishing them on DigiMeme and then sharing them on my private profile, which was also followed by other friends from the bubble. And within uh, three weeks, I could stop sharing it on my profile because it was already self growing with other people sharing the content so yes it was quite it was quite quick we should explain another thing because for a long time it was anonymous the channel nobody knew who is behind it and it was source of a lot of speculation mm. uh, i spoke to many people about this and there were so many theories that someone from really high up must be behind it because there was a lot of insight deep insight actually <laughs> in it so it, it seemed that somewhere is there who really knows what he or she's talking about and one of the diplomats I, i spoke to he was convinced that probably it is ursula von der leyen herself because you know <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> she lives in the building of the european commission she's there alone at nights who knows what she's doing when she likes want to get it out of her system what she's spending the, ha the whole day with right <laughs> wow this is so this was, this was this was quite intriguing i a little bit started to think about it so what what made you to come out let's say and you know one there was this special occasion in European Parliament and uh, now suddenly everybody knew that it's you behind it you like officially introduce yourself so what, what, what was the motivation in the beginning to, to be, keep it anonymous and then why do you say decided to come out well, the motivation to keep it anonymous is uh, well uh, we all like uh, freedom of speech until <laughs> it criticizes and as I was uh, you know I, I had a contract as a as a external contractor so you know it's something that they can fire you <laughs> within two days right. uh, i thought well <laughs> let, let's uh, let's not say too much um, that it's me 
and um, that's why I, I kept it hidden. Also, it helped me for inspiration because now I cannot go to a meeting or go to a party in the bubble without people knowing, ah, DJ Mim is here. But back then it was great because I could talk to people and I would get a lot of ideas on memes or describing situations. Uh, because don't forget, I, when I when I moved to Brussels, I, I, I'm a IT guy, right? So I didn't know anything about the real intricacies of the EU. I just know that I was absolutely pro EU because I love to travel and I love to speak languages and I have a lot of friends all over Europe. So for me, that's enough to be pro European. All the rest, the money, the, the stuff, yes, it's important, but the spirit, uh, the Erasmus spirit is what makes uh, European Union successful. And uh, so for me, it was a continuous discovering on new things I didn't know. For example, uh, the fancy university where the best uh, people go, the College of Europe, I didn't even know it existed. So, and then I had a lot of friends from this university and suddenly I, I understood, okay, this is a big thing <laughs> here. Uh, and uh, so this um, continuous um, growing in and learning about the U, uh, it was good that it happened when nobody knew that I was DG Meme. Eventually the page grew so much that I was interviewed on Politico Europe, which is a the most read magazine in the EU bubble and they wanted to put a picture of me on the article. I said, no, you're crazy. You can put the log of DG Meme. I don't want to show my face. But um, yeah, little by little, I kept receiving more and more requests. Why don't you come to speak at this event? And I realized if I want to be more impactful i have eventually to show my face because that's what people need uh, the ideas are okay but they also want to to have a face unfortunately i'm not like i don't really enjoy that people recognize me on the street in brussels it's, uh, yeah it's, it's a bit disturbing but still you have to decide it's a trade-off and uh, so I, I decided okay i'm gonna treat my audience and i i went to this um, wine bar uh, in, in Brussels, it's a very good Piedmont wine, they have great catering, and I talked to the manager and I said, listen, I have zero budget, but I tell you, if I make the reveal event here, I think at least 200 people are going to show up. So uh, can we do the event here? And he told me, well, I will ask some uh, you people, give me a couple of days and I will let you know. And within two hours, he called me back immediately, say, yes, yes, let's do it here, right? Uh, so that so was, how many people showed up? Uh, more, I think 220, something like this. Unfortunately, there nice. was a huge queue at the entrance. So many people were queuing and then they just left. Mm -hmm. And it was unfortunate because there was space to enter. There was just, you know, when, when there is a bit of slowdown. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a nice moment. We had huge problems with the audio, I remember. So in the end, it was not very easy to, to hear what I was saying. But still, uh, it was a funny evening and there was an amazing food. So everybody was uh, happy and maybe even a bit tipsy that evening. Did it change your life when you put your face in the front? Well, not immediately, but uh, I mean... Well, you course, don't work in the European Commission anymore, right? So. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no, exactly. I, I, was, I always been an external uh, con contractor, so I, do, I don't... Uh, work in Brussels anymore, but uh, my, my colleagues were quite uh, amused, mm -hmm. especially some close friends slash colleagues to whom I still didn't say it because I didn't want to reveal that it was me. They were really shocked. And, uh, I can't believe the other day I was telling you how funny this page is. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, uh, but um, overall, yes, that, uh, suddenly I could go to events and accept invitations and make interviews showing my face. And, and that was a bit, a bit easier to, to grow the audience because then I could, uh, that was the next step, uh, was uh, I could reach uh, you politicians. So I've been interviewing uh, important commissioners. I don't know, Vestager, Dombrovskis. I, I met Ursula von der Leyen for a coffee. I mean, all this stuff were not possible without revealing my identity. Yeah. So in the end, I'm happy I did it. You say it very casually. I was in Brussels for many years as a journalist. And I, when I wanted to do interview with Ursula von der Leyen, I had to try like for two years. And then it was group interviews. So it was like yeah. 20 other people in the room. So it, it's hard to say if it, if it was still an interview or I was just like having an opportunity to be but there. In fact, bit. I did not interview her. It was a 20 minutes coffee where I pitched my idea of how the EU communication should change so i show her i went there with memes and show her memes and talk about uh, what what should be done in my opinion to to improve a bit and make you more interesting to general audience how is it to meet the people the politicians you used to make fun of before or you, you are still making fun of them actually right 
Uh, it's great because you see the difference between uh, their public image and the private image. If, for example, uh, Dombrovskis, I don't know if the, the audience know Valdis. Um, in all the pictures he published of himself, he's shaking hands and he has this very straight face. And I suppose we have him here just to give you an idea. Yeah, he's the vice executive know. vice yes, president of the commission. Anyways, and uh, he, he's yes. quite famous for like for having zero emotions. Yes, yes. He's definitely a very clever person. He has a, it's called eidetic memory, like he's the kind of person that reads a paper once and he remembers all the numbers and references and date. So uh, he has a very rational approach to things. But in the end, when I met him in person, he was smiling, he was very welcoming, he was even making a few jokes. Uh, so it do, was. Do you remember some? <laughs> some well, now it was more like a uh, funny comment oh, right. on, what, on what we were saying. I would really love to see it because he's like, he always seemed like a cyborg to me a bit. And the creator like forgot to, you know, uh, load software for emotions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so definitely he's, uh, when we were discussing, uh, well, he was the prime minister of Latvia and he guided the government uh, transitioning from uh, Latas, Latas, I think, to Euro. And I asked him, so how did you persuade people that this was the right choice? You know, something that in the Czech Republic you still didn't manage to, to transition to. Uh, so he told me, well, uh, I am an economist, so I analyzed the economic situation. I did the mathematics and then explained people that uh, with economics, it was a great choice for us. So absolutely like very, very rational in his <laughs> approach, which as an engineer, I, I, I can say, well, it, it's good to have somebody so rational. But of course, if you come Combine it with more emotional people, like I don't know, Margrethe Vestager. When I asked similar question, she was like, "Like, how do you know she's taking decision that impact uh, the whole uh, uh, internal market of the European Union?" So very difficult decision. Uh, so, Margrethe, when when do you know that your decision is right? And her answer was, "When my mind, my heart, and my guts say the same thing, then I know that I'm taking the right decision." So, a uh, completely different approach to, to uh, EU matters. Um, uh, but nevertheless, no, he, he was very funny to meet Dombrowski in, in, in person. And uh, I think he also had, he had a great fun in the interview. And uh, yeah, then I asked him for some picture of, of his youth. And he told me he didn't have, but if I waited a couple of weeks to publish the interview, he would go to Riga to his house and scan them. So it was like, wow, this was so beautiful. So I'm the only person who has a, a picture of Dombrovskis as a child uh, watering his plants at home. So <laughs> this is this is really beautiful when you when you create this kind of connection. So in a way, he's cute. And I asked him, why do you always look so serious in pictures that in official pictures? And it's like, well, I, I think it's just how I am. I am representing the institution and the institution is a serious stuff and I have to look serious so this is his uh, his way of of reacting to to representing uh, the EU institutions so, yeah. I was laughing before because you were like it was exactly his voice <laughs> you made before that was really funny and I didn't hear many laughs uh, in our audience so that brings me to another questions I wanted to ask how difficult it is to to make fun of things that are quite like it's it's inside humor a bit, right? You have to know the politics, or you have to know what you are talking about to get the reference. Often, so how do you like balance, you know, that, that you strike the right right tone, that it is approachable to general public, but still you can make fun of something that's really European. Yeah, well, as any comedian would tell you, the the secret of good comedy is delivery in the end. So it doesn't matter what you're really saying, it's the way you're saying, you know. For a comedian, uh, the facial expression, the tone of voice, that's what makes a joke funny or not. And in the world of memes, uh, the delivery is based uh, basically a combination of a great picture that depicts the situation and a great short headline that gives the the punchline basically so when you when you find these two elements together then you have a successful meme which is understandable for any type of audience of course there are a lot of inner jokes sometimes there is a meme that has actually three a reference inside of it and maybe people will just see the first reference and still laugh but those that have the biggest laugh are those that understand like the process that is behind it and it has uh, three layers of of fun let's say <laughs>
you are also a bit risky in it sometimes. Uh, I've just recently come across one of your memes and it was just right after the shooting of Donald Trump and you published a picture of him and Donald Tusk at that time, President of the European Council, making like the gesture of, of, of a pistol <laughs> at him. Do you also like try to write find the right balance between what you can still do, what might be offensive to the people in the bubble, for example, or not? Uh, no, I mean, no, that one, absolutely not. I think political correctness in our days is uh, dangerous because you don't call things the way you should call them. And then it's hard to have a conversation when when you when you don't understand exactly what you're talking about so this thing that everybody gets easily offended nowadays is not my problem of course it is not my intent to offend a specific group but uh, every time i make a joke that uh, might uh, be perceived as uh, sexist then i have to read all the comments of angry feminists that they are missing the point that i'm not uh, supporting sexism and just pointing out that this was a sexist behavior so according to them you shouldn't show a picture of berlusconi looking at the ass of a journalist uh, the, because it's sexist yes, but i'm not saying this is a good behavior i'm making fun of it you should understand this is to support your cause and you have to accept its freedom of speech you cannot uh, block everything so i i don't really care if somebody's offended specifically for this picture you mentioned it was needed to publish it because the uh, right wing parties of uh, Poland, they were using that picture to point out, you see, so there is task in a meeting, jokingly making the, the, the gun sign to the back of uh, Donald Trump. And they were using it to support some uh, complete nut job theory that somehow uh, Tusk is involved in the shooting. Uh, completely ridiculous stuff. So it's good in that situation to use the same picture as your enemy and and twist the point of view and and try to make it fun so that people will not take whatever the uh, the alt right is is uh, writing seriously because it has been already debunked. Mm -hmm. Your job is a job. It's a hobby, a bit still. Yeah, a hobby. But uh, your hobby job is difficult because you make fun of EU politics. Not everybody follows, and it was, I think it's even more difficult because you speak to different cultures, to 27 different cultures I in Europe, and we have a bit different types of humor. Do you see it on, for example, statistics? If you look, uh, what, what kind of people follow you? Are there differences maybe in reactions also that you make some joke and suddenly only, I don't know, Czechs and Germans laugh and nobody else are, are retweeting you? Is this happening of, a uh, lot? Yeah, 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 yes, of course, of course. Uh, every uh, humor is a cultural thing. Uh, I love Czech people because your humor is very close to mine, very dark. Uh, so um, I am I'm usually aware when I publish something which type of uh, audience I'm going for. So if I'm making a joke about uh, President Pavel, I know that only Czech people will most likely understand because the rest of the other countries might not know who he is. But still, those that follow my page will find out, oh, this super hot uh, uh, man with this beautiful white mustache is from the Czech Republic and he looks really cool and he managed to find one million uh, bullets out of in here. You know, <laughs> these are these are ways that you can talk um, at European Union level about the European Union, which is something that uh, that very few journalists do, because when you read uh, Czech press, they talk about the EU, but always from the Czech perspective. We got that much money, or uh, this happened, there was this rule that affect us, but you don't have a, a global approach in EU communication, communicating the EU for the European Union as a whole. And uh, that's what I humbly try to achieve. I'm really lucky because i love to travel and i've traveled a lot in my 20s i like i've been to every small village everywhere around europe so i i gather a lot of interesting insight on the on the local culture and this helps me a lot to to make uh, jokes i mean i know that uh, uh, moravia and bohemia are not good friends which is something that if you ask uh, somebody from portugal they wouldn't even be able to point out on a map where the the two are because it's very far and then you can bring these jokes at at eu level i think it's uh, it's very beautiful and and important so that we can all laugh about our politicians <laughs> You made a lot of Czech references during our discussion, but you make it also quite quite a lot in, in your content, in your memes. You've mentioned Petr Pavel 
and uh, this beauty contest he is now having. St is it still ongoing with Pedro Sanchez, the Prime Minister of Spain? Yes. Who's the that, winner? Yeah, that, that was not from my account, but it was somebody else. I just retweeted it, I oh, think. Right. But, uh, yes. but you made a staring contest between the Prime Minister Stare, Pedro yes, Fiala and Boris Dombrovskis, we spoke about. Yes. Uh, a lot of more. Is it just any particular reason behind it why you target this Czech uh, references more often? Well, I go where there is a, a good picture. I think <laughs> this picture of Petr Fiala looking super serious was it was just there. I couldn't, I couldn't think. But okay, this could this almost match the seriousness of Valdis Dombrovskis, and they could have a, a staring competition. And the first one to laugh loses. And I was trying to imagine who is gonna win in the end, <laughs> and that was uh, that was the idea. Yeah. Is it a steel tie or do you have a winner? I think it's a tie, yes. Tie, yeah. <laughs> I will give an opportunity also to the audience. If there is anybody here who would like to ask a question, please do so. Feel free to do and we will also reward you with one of our keep caps. So if you are interested either in the question or in the keep cap, feel free to, feel free to ask. And uh, if no question is here or, or yeah, is it perfect? The, uh, microphone. I'll repeat the question after you. Uh, yes, very good question. Um, um, well, first of all, to make fun of something, you have to be in a specific, at least me, I have to be in a specific uh, mind state. I cannot be too angry, otherwise what I want to make fun will become just a slogan, just a motto. So um, that's that's important. Usually to make fun of these people is just enough to listen to what they say, because uh, to any rational analysis, uh, what they're saying is usually bollocks. And uh, yeah, recently there has been this rant by this Polish right-wing uh, politician who went on stage and accused von der Leyen <laughs> of a series of things that the president of the commission is not responsible for. But it looked great on, on the press, so everybody was posting this uh, hysterical rant that this MEP is having. You, you mean the woman who are tearing down? Turn up paper in front of her, or that was ah uh, no, that was no, another. No, else. it was uh, just like I don't know. You're responsible for all the raping that happened in the EU, all the uh, crises that you want to let all the migration. You know, it is your bullshit that they say. And and of course, uh, looking at this on stage, such a disrespectful and fake accusations, it was very annoying, and I was really angry. So it took me a few minutes to boil down and then finally I made this meme where she's accusing von der Leyen of uh, out of sync subtitles online of all the missing socks in the washing machine and the fact that I cannot find the car keys in my purse and I think that that, that worked quite that worked quite well so enough yes you listen to them and the, the pitiness that their stupidity will be evident to anybody who has a, a bit of understanding and uh, rational ability and uh, yes it's important that's that's all it takes do you have already some favorites in the new european parliament someone who you suspect might be a good source of inspiration for making fun of i have great expectation about nardella who is an italian uh, former major of florence uh, he has a very expressive face and he looks very lost in the parliament. But uh, as there is 54% new MEPs, I'm still, I don't know them uh, all yet. So I will, I'm sure they will amaze me in the next year. Have you noticed the new guy from Cyprus, the, the yes. YouTuber? It's quite funny. Yeah, yeah. It's a guy that makes TikTok posts about everything he does in there. So there was like... Today I'm going to vote if the European, uh, if uh, Ursula von der Leyen is going to stay the president of the Commission or not. It's super serious issue, guys. So I'm letting you decide <laughs> if you want or yeah, not. Yeah, amazing! Like <laughs> wow, I, I like him. Very genuine. He should work for the Jimim, and uh, he should not be an MEP. I mean, he let people on Instagram decide if he has to vote yes or no. 
<laughs> to von der Leyen, where Instagram is full of bots and Russians <laughs> are the best at making bots and you let people decide because this is your idea of direct democracy, yes. But he's a cool guy. I mean, he's using you politics to gather even more followers on his account. So definitely great communicator. And well, uh, Everybody, everybody has to try his ways. I'm very proud he went hitchhiking from Brussels to Strasbourg, and I love hitchhiking. Uh, so it was very beautiful to see a politician hitchhiking. Definitely, I, I suppose there is the, the, there might be also good things coming out of that. But in general, as approach, uh, it's of course yeah. very scary. I would say. Unsurprisingly, Russian bots voted against. Ursula yes, of course line. you <laughs> voted, and 70 said to vote no. And then he didn't even explain. Okay give your audience let them choose and explain okay if if you want to know what are the alternatives who else could become president of the commission <laughs> you should give a bit of a bit of context you are you are you are in a powerful communicating position you should you should make things easier it's not enough to say ah choose do you want uh, rizek or do you want salad i mean yes and what are other other alternatives to that what happens if i say no what happens if she loses the vote these are things that a good communicator and a good politician should also ask and explain their voters I'm looking in the audience if anybody else have a question. Go ahead, yeah. Did you get it? I missed the beginning of your question. If you, if you, re if you read the comments, oh, right. please help them. And if the conversation with the haters somehow change, if, they, if, if he's able to change their opinion. Yeah, OK. Uh, yes, unfortunately, I have to read all the comments because I, I tolerate many things. Uh, when they start insulting other followers, I have to block them immediately. I don't tolerate offense like insults. This is not acceptable to me. Otherwise, I let them write all the idiotic uh, comments. And I usually don't engage with them because, come on, honestly, like they are most likely some guys in a Chinese factory writing these comments. I, I, I don't have time capacity to try to change somebody's opinion online. It's pointless. I, I'm happy when my followers do this. Uh, it, it's great because uh, they, they help me. Like sometimes they engage with these people and you clearly see that 70% of the time these are just fake commenters that keep uh, you know derailing the conversation and and spreading their fake news but in other in other in rare situations there is some some hope of having a conversation among people that have different point of views which is the basic of democracy so sometimes when i see it's a account i don't know a professor that comments against it and i see he has a track of records and he's probably a real person then i i try to respectfully interact and have some serious conversation but in general i mean i don't have a team that supports this so i don't i don't have much time so i don't know if anybody ever changed his opinion on online debate there will be studies about this i suppose and do you think that dgme might actually change opinion of people on eu or at least understand them a bit more what's going on there oh of course this is uh, without any doubts i mean you have because i make fun of i don't know the committee of the regions then people find out that there is something like the committee of the regions oh i didn't know there was a, a place that supposedly can bring together regional majors and regional powers to discuss uh, common solutions to common problems which is a, a, a very beautiful thing and um, yes the, i have no doubts there yes it, because we should talk about it already talking about it is uh, half the the The, the part and you should talk in a way that people are, are following and are engaged and uh, by, by doing that already I mean if you present the European Union project and you don't only let uh, negative people talking about it uh, I suppose 
most people will understand hey it's a, it's a, after all it's a great project I mean, not not perfect obviously but the more we have uh, uh, people that know how it works taking decisions the better it will get obviously if 30% of the EU parliament is made by people that are just there to vote everything down and try to meddle everything down because they are paid by the kremlin it's much harder to improve the situations that you have so it's it's these are processes that take uh, centuries as the Bene Gesserit would, would tell you. I'm glad you say because I quite often actually recommend DG Meme as a source of education a bit oh, wow, because you in a way explain you know what trialogue is what in the institutions are why they are so confusing yes. <laughs> with their names so 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 that that's good you're, you're, you're feeling the same way I'm still asking if there are any more questions in there right favorite Czech politician? Well, okay, I mean, I suppose Havel would be the standard answer, right? <laughs> great, uh, uh, great guy. Of uh, living ones, well, President Pavel, uh, definitely the, the best, like the, the way he acts, what he says. He made very interesting comment about also the, the danger of political correctness. Uh, so I think it's... Uh, it's good. I had the pleasure to meet Martin Dvorak recently to interview him, and I was uh, positively surprised. By quite, quite a funny, outspoken, outspoken guy. Otherwise, yes. I mean, I cannot claim I'm a, an expert of EU politics. I never met uh, Jourova. I think his head of cabinet didn't like me. I tried to contact once because we were both supposed to go to Florence for a conference, and I said maybe we can have a short uh, chat. But and they never even replied to me. But uh, pity. Yeah. I want to appreciate your Z in Rizek. That was excellent. Oh, <laughs> A lot of practice behind it, I'm sure. <laughs> Any more questions? Go ahead. Special question for Italian politics. I find out after years studying in Italy that it's even more funny to watch Italian local politics and regional politics than even Eastern European, Central European one. Do you find also some? Yeah, yeah, obviously it's uh, really amazing. The country that gave us a renaissance also has a <laughs> very famous political class. Yes, the great account, uh, crazy ass moments in Italian politics is like really, really big. Uh, in fact, it's very hard at a meme level to compete in the Italian arena. Uh, I tried to have DG Meme Italia and I realized, okay, my memes were okay, but the, 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 the many pages that are there, they were at another level. Um, um, so uh, yeah, it's funny to, to, to follow other countries' politics and see that in the end the problems um, the problems are the same. And I'm glad you have you did Erasmus there or ah okay. Uh, where in which city? In Perugia, lovely, very beautiful. Okay, and this gave you in one year you got uh, enough input. Well, okay, okay. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm uh, happy that um, that our politicians entertain uh, entertain you. And uh, there is uh, this, uh, the, in the book, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There is this point where uh, one of the character uh, claims that. Uh, in the end, what people want from politicians is not somebody who solves problems, but somebody who entertains them with scandals. So the president of the galaxy is the person that has the highest number of scandals and lovers and addictions so that uh, there is always something going on and people are entertained. Of course, uh, somebody coming from the Enlightenment uh, philosophers, I, I hope that this is not true. But in Italy, is unfortunately... Uh, yes, the, the more you capture the imagination, make them dream, and they will, uh, and they will give you power. Yeah. Okay. So, who is the Zafod Bibelbrock of European politics? <laughs> Who's oh, that? What, what was his name? The, the president of the galaxy, Zafod yeah. Bibelbrock, or yeah, something, something like this? Like that, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, who is it for you? Well, <laughs> with big scandals. Uh, I'm sure Philip Turek will give us great, <laughs> great, great, uh, uh, great, great ideas in that case. Yeah, well, you know, usually you politicians are not the standard politicians that you have at home that are saying, let's go to protest in, uh, 
in the square and bringing million people on the streets. They are more like compromised leaders, very skilled. They are somewhere between a technocrat and a politician. So I suppose probably their scandals are a bit, are a bit less. Uh, Yes, I mean, think about, I don't know, the poor Finnish people. For them, the highest scandal was when their prime minister, Sanna Marin, besides that she was dancing in a pub that, that was like big, and she also paid 35 euros breakfast with her um, uh, government card and not with her own private card. And that was something that Finnish people went on complaining for a month. And it was, from an Italian perspective, so beautiful to see that somebody could be enraged because a politician misused 35 euros of, of budget. And it's beautiful. I mean, with such an approach, imagine how beautiful our EU budget would be. <laughs> <laughs> But hey, it takes time. And the previous government in Finland of Anterine that collapsed because the post office workers went to streets. <laughs> that's also quite unusual. <laughs> no, that's also cute. <laughs> yeah. I still want to ask about the personalities. You spoke about Italian politicians. Giorgia Meloni is quite often uh, in Gigi Mim, the new queen of roll eyes ro or eye rolling uh, of Europe, I would say. But uh, is there someone who, because there are politicians that are not not fun at the first glance, but you still somehow manage to make fun of them. And then there are politicians that are just not fun. That's it, period. <laughs> Do you see this? This kind of this this uh, this kind of difference between them. Are there any European politicians you just didn't manage to make any joke on them or, or about them, even yeah, though you tried? I, I'm, yeah, I honestly, not really, because there will always be a moment where a politician loses his aplomb and detachment. Uh, I think I don't know Yurova, for example, somebody quite hard to make fun of because she's always she's not doing any step out of the of her comfort zone and yet somebody sent me a picture of her when she went to Greece and she has the Parthenon on the back and she's very impeccably elegantly dressed and that I use that to make fun of you know the classic uh, Czech tourists that are always going with sandals and white socks and that's how European perceive it but look how elegant she looks like so it's not true that that they are if I think the the caption was Uh, when they tell you Czech, Czech tourists always wear sandals and white socks and she says uh, kurva please because she's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> elegant uh, so th that was beautiful because then a Czech understood the fun and they didn't take it badly because they are Czech and I love them and the other countries understood okay but she looks really cool here and then there is a video where she looks like super annoyed and that went really big and the caption was when you when you see that Anno is joining a group with the far right and she obviously looks uh, displeased so yes i think uh, in the end if you have good contacts with cabinets and journalists you always get pictures that are fun enough to make fun of anybody okay so last opportunity for any question in the audience go ahead <laughs> yes, it would be beautiful. A chunk of the EU budget, one percent of what Digicom gets, it would be very <laughs> appreciated. The future, I hope I can focus more on short videos because I produced my first short movie, like it's a uh, four minutes. It was a hell of a job because I was filming and editing it. Uh, but it was a lot of fun for me and I see there is a lot of expressive potential. So I hope I can focus a bit more on the YouTube channel in the in the years to come. And uh, also I hope I can do even more interviews. But let's see, I'm quite busy until the end of the year, but 2025 it it will bring hopefully new new meetings. I've been trying hard to get Kaya Kallas for an interview. So I hope that's the, the next the big shot that I'm gonna interview. I envy you. Uh, last question from me. We we started by saying that uh, the Jimim started out of despair, basically, or out of anger, as you describe it. Is it different now, six years later? Do you still feel angry sometimes about the way you communicate? Is it getting better? Yeah, it is getting better for sure. And without being arrogant i think i had uh, an impact in, in <laughs> that so <laughs> if somebody writes a book about the history of you communication i don't say digimim will have a chapter but at least a couple of paragraphs at a certain point 
yeah, it's getting a bit better also because the new generation of communicators that there are skilled people in the in the communication of the U. It's just their ideas are cut by the you know higher the higher the idea goes, the more weakened it gets. Um, uh, but uh, yes, they. Uh, they had a, a lot of hope when I met the president because they were. Uh, I could hear the their voices whispering and saying, oh, "Come on, t show her that we can be a bit more daring in the communication. We can engage a bit more with all the fake news that are uh, spread online." So, yes, it is improving, and I hope this new commission will have an even even better one. Yeah. You will definitely deserve at least some of the, of the paragraphs in, in history of EU communication. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you also to the audience. I wish you good luck and a lot of inspiration in, in coming years. Uh, I'm sure we will have a lot of good laughs uh, with DG Meme and I wish you a lot of followers too. So if you did not follow yet, please start doing so. It's really fun. Thank you once again and please give a round of applause to Fabio Thank Valeri. you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.